Thomas means is that God is the sheer act of being itself. Not this or that type of thing. Being without restriction and without limitation. In creatures, there's a distinction between what Thomas calls essence, what it is, and existence, that it is. So for example, I'm a being, but I'm a human being, a being of very particular type. This camera to which I'm gazing right now is a being of a very definite technological type. The trees around me are beings of a botanical type. But none of this obtains in regard to God. There is in God no distinction between essence and existence. To be God is to be, to be. You see how this is just a more philosophically precise reformulation of the great answer that God gave to Moses when the patriarch asked, what's your name? And God said, I am who I am. As the simple reality, God is that whose being is unconditioned, unrestricted, unlimited. This is why Thomas speaks of God as infinite, without borders. It's also why he's described as immaterial. It's not as though God is less than material. Rather, his being transcends the limits inherent in a material manner of existence. This is also why God is referred to as eternal. Time conditions material things, but God stands outside of time. Thomas also speaks of God as immutable or unchangeable. This has nothing to do with impassivity in the psychological sense. It means that God cannot improve or move from an inferior to a superior state. Instead, he's utterly perfect and fulfilled in his manner of being. Perhaps you've noticed by now that this procedure is largely negative. Thomas telling us what God is not rather than what God is. What does it mean to be immaterial, eternal, infinite, immutable? Well, we really don't know, for nothing in our ordinary experience is like that. Nevertheless, real spiritual insights can be gleaned from these reflections. To say that God is immutable is to say that he's reliable. He doesn't pass in and out of emotional states. He doesn't fall in and out of love with the world he's made. To say that he's Eternal is to say that he's not stuck in any particular moment of time, and therefore is present to all moments of time. To say that God is immaterial is to say he's not restricted in any one place, but can therefore be present to all places. thing in the world, not a thing at all, not a being at all, 
but being itself. This is so important for the debates going on right now, because you read the great atheists, people like Feuerbach and Marx and Freud and Sartre, and now read their disciples today, you know, the new atheists so-called. They all share this in common. They all think of God as some big being. Some say he, he exists, some say he doesn't. I call it the Yeti theory of God, you know. Some say there's a Bigfoot, others say there isn't. Let's go find out, let's look for evidence. See, but the problem is the question set up entirely the wrong way. The creator of the universe is not an item within the universe. Think of the Russian cosmonaut that goes up, you know, in the 1950s, goes up into space. Says, hey, I'm going up in the heavens, there's no God. Well, see, that's precisely the wrong way to look for God. You don't find him as one more thing in the universe. Rather, God is the condition for the possibility of the existence of contingent things. That's a fancy way of saying that God is the sheer act of being itself, in and through which all finite things find their existence. And so part of the problem with atheism is it sets up the question the wrong way. If they knew what Thomas Aquinas meant by God, they wouldn't ask the question that way. Got your brain spun around a couple times. Wow, Don, it's good to see you. Good to see you. How'd you sneak in? Stealth mode. You're a big guy. Um, I will never forget. Wow. In the middle of the master's program. We're studying the book written by Bishop Barron on St. Thomas Aquinas. And I thought I had a pretty good understanding of God. And then one of the things that came out of our study of that book was, if you think you understand it, you don't got it. <laughs> because God is beyond understanding. But one of the things I realized is I had put God in a box and I didn't realize it. I did not know that I had placed him there. And I realized it when I heard this statement that he said today. God is not a being within the universe. He's being itself. And I suddenly realized I had compressed God as the biggest thing in his universe. And the reality is, he made the universe. He's beyond it. He's in it. He's outside of it. He's timeless. But time has no, no pressing thing on God. Because he created time. He's already seen the end of your life. And he sees the beginning of your life all at the same time because he invented time. And I took a deep breath and I thought, I had to become Catholic to figure this out. Woo! It was worth it. I mean, everything about God expanded beyond limits for me in that moment. I'll never forget that day. Never forget that. So when I hear this, how many know we're not talking about St. Catherine of Siena now? <laughs> right? She went around the barn one way. Thomas is going the exact opposite way. But guess what? They all achieved sainthood in much different ways. Woo! Who have I got <clears throat> reading the Bible? Is that you, Trish? Are these my notes for today? Uh, yes, those are your notes. I have no idea. It could be a grocery list. What does it say? I saw the whole thing, but I don't see it up there. Okay. It must be another time. Look up uh, John 15, 18, and 19. And then uh, put your finger there and then look up Matthew 8, 21 through 27. Sure. What two things concerning St. Thomas made him a radical in his time. 
In our present culture, how can you as a Christian be perceived as a radical? What was radical about St. Thomas? Two things. Excuse me? Ooh, very good. And it said he, he it was an under the table. Under, because what was controversy about Aristotle? In fact, quite frankly, that controversy still exists today. If you're not Catholic, they look at Catholics and say they gave themselves up to the Greeks. Now, why would that be controversial, do you think? Was Aristotle Christian? No. No. What was he? Pagan. He was a pagan, but what was his main occupation? What did he do on a, a daily basis? Scientist. He was a scientist, yes, but basically he was a philosopher. He was the one that looked at the big questions of life. And here's what's different about Catholics that I love. I love it. Have I told you I really love being Catholic? Because <laughs> I really do. Catholics are open to the fact that truth in this world and in any time frame, any era, truth can be found in many different places. And even if it's not understood as Christian, it's still truth. So God has revealed truths to many different people through many different kinds of history. And the Catholics have been open enough to say, wait a minute, that's truth. We need to listen to that man. Now, not everything he's saying is truthful. So what do you do with the untruth? Chuck it. Very good, Laura. You, just, you did that on your shoulder. <laughs> Chuck it. Right? So the yes. trick is how to recognize. Yes, and to trust the church has sifted that through and filtered it for us so we truly are embracing truth and not heresy. Right? And Aristotle in the time of St. Thomas was in fact being rediscovered. A lot of his stuff had, had basically been forgotten and now it's being brought back. It's being being published in Latin, written in Latin, and now these budding universities are beginning to study it. They didn't have the universities. Thomas was one of the first ones to participate in what would become a university. Think about that. And his mind. I mean, what is this boy? If somebody had to sit by and make sure he doesn't eat something inedible. And how could he dictate in his sleep, for heaven's sakes? This great saint. Okay, go ahead, Trish. John 15, verse 18. If the world hates you, realize that it hated me first. If you belong to the world, the world would love its own. But because you do not belong to the world, and I have chosen you out of the world, the, world the other thing that was controversial besides Aristotle in the life of St. Thomas was the band of beggars and preachers that he began hanging out with. And they were just beginning their order in the world and in the church. And just as he said, Bishop Barron said, some people saw it as a renewal in the church. Other people said they're just filthy beggars. So that was controversial, right? But think about what you just heard. Read it one more time, Trish. If the world hates you, realize that it hated me first. Stop, 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 stop. Have you been hated by the world yet? Mm. Well, I don't know. Well, it's coming. <laughs> I promise you. Because it's getting darker out there all the time. But the light of God is what? Getting brighter and brighter and brighter. So if you haven't run into that, golly, you're an idiot, you will. I promise you, you will. Because the world hated Jesus. The world hated Jesus. Not his followers. 
And the world, you can see it now in our culture. All the Ten Commandments have been taken out of every public building that ever existed. They're, they've taken them down and sometimes they just removed everything because it was on a big pillar of something. And they took the whole pillar out. Right? I remember pictures of Jesus that used to be in our schools. Not there. And the Catholics are thought of as being way out of date. In fact, if you watch any of the royal way, you've realized how far from orthodox faith we have come. They hated Thomas for a lot of ways, for a lot of reasons. Even his own students called him the dumb ox of Sicily. But I love what his mentor said, Albert the Great. You wait. The bellowing of this ox will one day fill the world. And he did. Let's read the next one. Matthew? Yes. 8.21 The true disciple. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but only the one who does the will of my Father in heaven. Many will say to me on that day, Lord, 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 did we not prophesy in your name? Did we not drive out demons in your name? Did we not do mighty deeds in your name? Then I will declare to them solemnly, I never knew you. Depart from me, you evil doers. What does it mean when that scripture says, I never knew you? What does it mean? And what does it mean when we think about our relationship with the Lord? Does He know us? I think part of that, if you want to think through it, is we begin to be known by God when we begin to know Him. When our relationship draws close to Him, and He's always present to us, then we, be, we begin to be known by God. So we can always trust Him. Here's the question. Can He trust us? Can He trust us today? Can He trust us next week? Can He trust us in good times? Can He trust us in bad times? Can He trust us? That's an important question. But it's hard. We're so stupid human. <laughs> How many would say amen to that? Amen. I mean, truly. And this is why these saints, I mean, I've been loving these classes. Because, you know, St. Saint, uh, Saint Thomas and St. Catherine, their hearts and their lives were caught, even though he wrote 50 volumes, double column, millions of words. What was his purpose? Why did he do all that? Why did he dictate to three people at a time? One reason. He did it to bring people to Jesus. And then that begs the question, what are we doing? The baptismal vows that you and I took said, go out into all the world and what? Preach the gospel. Baptize them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. And the question becomes, as we see the lives of these saints, is what have we done to fulfill that vow that we made? Now, we can't all preach. We can't all dictate to three people at one time. We, don't, we have different gifts, different kinds of callings, different vocations. But the purpose and the leading of the Holy Spirit is the same. Amen? All right, I want to show you a, uh, an application question real quick down here. By the way, these are out on the website. You can download them, print them out. Thomas's call to the Dominicans was strongly opposed by his own family. Have you had a similar experience in your call to a vocation? Describe the opposition you faced and the support you received, maybe from unexpected sources. 
Tell me, what kind of resistance have you had in your life as you began to obey God in whatever He called you to? Shad? Yes. <laughs> Sorry? <laughs> we'll come back to you. <laughs> Anybody? When I first became Catholic, all my Christian friends were shocked. Shocked how, well, Karen? They, this one guy said, well, Karen, I kind of thought you already had it right. What are you doing? Yeah. Going to the Catholic Church. Yeah. And, and did you have an unexpected support from anybody? Well, it turns out my budding best friend, which I didn't know at the time, was a Catholic, so she became a big... I remember when I came into St. Teresa, <laughs> and you had the look on your face, what are you doing here? <laughs> it wasn't opposition, nobody it was else, wonderful surprise. Nobody else knew what we were getting but me <laughs> when you came into the church. I will tell I you. I felt the same way when I saw his picture on the RCI thing. I said, David, that certainly isn't the Tim Oglesby I know. <laughs> it was. I would have never dreamed it. I will tell you, my father still wonders about what I've done. Yes. Miss Jackie Oglesby, what would you like to share this morning? You are asking what resistance is like. You start talking about Jesus, about God, about anything that is holy, and a lot of people, they just blaze over. It's like they, they don't want to hear it, so they're looking for a way to go away from you. I never, she, she and I both never knew anti-Catholic sentiment until we began to move toward the church. And it is out there, guys. Mm -hmm. They don't think much of you. And a lot of them are pretty convinced none of you are Christian. <laughs> True? True? Yes, ma'am. Before, before I converted, I was one of those, you know, who was very anti-Catholic and very suspect of Catholics, you know. And then after, after I converted, then, you know, I grew up in a family that was very anti-Catholic. And I have a lot of uh, relatives of married, all the way Catholics. And so it's kind of like, sometimes it's like you're the elephant in the room, the thorn in the flesh. Not only the elephant, the pink elephant in the room yeah. of a weird color and a weird yeah. size and weird everything, yeah. right? Yeah, yeah. So uh, anyway, and then um, unfriended by Facebook friends and, you know, all, just all kinds of stuff. And um, But then, you know, that's, that's who we are. So. Why do you suppose that is? What have they got against the Catholic faith? What bothers them so much? That they're, they're, they're <laughs> fearful <laughs> that the church is what it claims to be. Yes. And yes. You you are that to them. Yes. And you know even my immediate family still. You know, we all are very anti-Catholic, but now that I'm Catholic, you know, they're like, don't even go there. If I put EWTN on the TV, my brother comes in and changes it immediately. Does he really? Oh, absolutely. It's so rude. I mean, it's just rude, you know, so, yeah. Shan? So. Yes. <laughs> um, uh, Father Blick makes some good comments every once in a while in his homilies. Uh, one of which was the theist believes in God. Yep. The Christian believes that Jesus Christ is God. Yep. The Catholic believes the church is Jesus Christ. Yep. And it, those little things hit me. And as a non Catholic in previous life, um, I was very much against the Catholic Church as well because I didn't understand the Catholic Church. But by golly, oh, oh, oh. Woo! <laughs> to quote whoever, <laughs> when, and when I started discerning the Catholic faith, 
and really seen the well, the joys and seen just the uh, theology behind it, it just all started making sense. I proclaim Jesus Christ more than I ever did. Yes. As a Christian. Because you had your religion and I had my religion and we were totally separate. You do your thing, I do my thing, we're perfectly fine. Now, well, and don't you, you think the, you need to come home? <laughs> the, the incarnation made the difference for me. Everything changed when I began to see the Catholic Church really believes in the incarnation and still does. Because as a Pentecostal and as a disciples of Christ and as a community or charismatic church, because Jesus was everywhere, he really was nowhere. And that sounds funny. But see, the Catholic Church says, oh, no, no, no. We have Jesus in our church, in a tabernacle, and there's a little candle flickering there to let you know that's Him. And I can think, you, oh, come on. Yeah. But when you spiritualize everything, which is not incarnation. Incarnation means the embodiment of Christ. This is my body. And everything about the Mass touches something physically in us. The incense oh, smells wonderful. The church, every, I, I love being in Mass. And look at those windows. Look how high that ceiling is. So not only do we you know, get that sense of, of Jesus in the spiritual side of it, He's in our stomach as well. I mean, we we eat him. We physically we eat him. Jesus. Oh, and you know, I don't know if this changed for you, but it did for me. When I heard the scripture as a Protestant, "I shall be with you till the end of the age." Now I got, "I shall be with you." Right? Yes. We partake in the divine nature, which just. That scares the. I don't know what Pewaden means, but it scares the Pewaden out of all kinds of Protestants. And here's why: deification, which is another way to say divination, which basically means God is changing us from day to day to become just like Him. We'll never be God, right? But His character, His very essence is in us, changing us from glory to glory to glory to glory. Yes, I see that. We're down to one hour. Thank you, Donald. I might have to spend three weeks on this guy. Pardon me? I might have to spend three weeks on this guy. We might. You yes. could spend a lifetime and you'd be only touching the That's exactly right. <laughs> yes. I just want to make one comment. You know, I hear these little snippets stick with me sometimes. But I think there's a part in the Maronite liturgy where um, the priest says, the God who hung the earth on the universe now hangs upon the cross. Yes. And that yes. just... Oh, that goes deep. Yeah. And here, here's the other. Read uh, what was the first one? You want to hear me? Yes. Hear, O Israel, the Lord is our God, the Lord alone. Okay, next. Thus says the Lord, Israel's King and Redeemer, the Lord of hosts. I am the first, and I am the last. There is no God but me. First, uh, the Alpha and the Omega. The beginning and the end. And here's the thing. Put yourself in Moses' skin. He's doing sheep stuff. He's a shepherd, right? Looks up on a hill. What does he see? Burning bush. i got to go see that. Because it doesn't seem to be consumed. It's just burning. How does that work? It gets close. Moses... Remove your sandal. You are on holy ground. 
And all of a sudden, he's standing in the presence of the unbegun God. But what do I say your name is? If you want me to go deliver the Israelites, I have to have a name. Why do you think he wanted that name? No one would believe him. That's true. What else? Names give us some control. <laughs> if I don't know your name, I don't have any control over you. But if I begin to know your name, I begin to have an attachment to you. So he wanted a name. I want your name. God said, I'll tell you my name. Tell him that I am. That I am. Or who I am. Which means I am being itself. Let me out of your box. Let me out of your box. There's a whole lot more coming. We may need to do another week. I don't know. We'll see. But we've got at least another week and then I'll figure out who. We're about halfway through next week. So we've got three more characters beyond St. Thomas. But Let's begin to thank God for all these wonderful saints. And they're right here with us. Incarnate means they're in that cloud of witnesses right around us. We can perceive them at Mass. They're there celebrating with us. Thank God. Amen. Amen. How many are really glad to see Karen? Yeah. And Karen, we're really hoping that you... You come back next week for the second part. I wish I could. She can get this stuff online, and she's told me she's watched some of that stuff. So that's one of the reasons we got it out there. So, Amen. Yes, Mr. Shad. Theology on Tap is tomorrow. Monday. Yes. Amen. All right. Aaron's brother. Cousin. Yeah. Cousin. Her cousin. Spiritual warfare. I don't know. Spiritual warfare. Spiritual warfare. The priest is given it. I mean. What time is it? It doesn't say in the morning. Seven. Six thirty if you want dinner. Yeah. And then it should start on Sunday. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, Lord God, we thank you for this time. Wow. Lord, Lord Jesus, Lord Jesus. It's just beyond our understanding that you would become one of us. That you would become, that we could put our arms around God. Hmm. Lord, teach us from all the saints. We thank you for every one of them that we've received truth and understanding. Thank you for the church, the magisterium, the catechism of the Catholic Church, all of those to help us keep in line with the truth. We thank you for it. We praise you for this day. This is the day that the Lord has made. As we pray, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us, and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Amen. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Y'all are awesome. Hallelujah. <laughs>